Hello, hope and pray you're having a wonderful day. Uh, we are. Uh, we have enjoyed the last couple of days, three days really, off and on, two, and, two or three days, being absolutely amazed by the creation of God in the Grand Canyon. That thing is amazing. You can't imagine, if you've not been there, okay, I'll, I'll be 70 this year, I've never seen it. I've seen pictures of it, I've seen tours given on the internet, but it's not like being there. It's amazing. God did an amazing job on that thing. Uh, <clears throat> but before we get into our lesson today, we're in John chapter 3. For those of you who've been following along, our theme is always living for Jesus. But we're now living for Jesus in the book of John. And last week we got up through verse 8 of John chapter 3. Jesus was talking with a wise old teacher by the name of Nicodemus, a member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish court of Israel. And uh, Jesus talks with them about what it means to be born again, uh, to be born not just physically, but to be born of water and the Spirit. And uh, Nicodemus didn't understand, but Jesus explained it to him. You need to be born of water, which is always baptism in any Greek, uh, all koine, uh, all koine language that mentions born of water always mentions baptism. Uh, physical blood, as we saw back in John chapter 1, verse 12 and 13, physical birth was called born of blood. Uh, so spiritual birth, it was born of water and the spirit. We looked at that last week. We got down through verse 8. Uh, in fact, uh, we're going to kind of run through verses 6 through 8 again this time just to make sure we have that down about what the spirit does in our lives. He's a person. He's not just a thing. He's not just a force from God. He's a person. But before we get into our text, we want to spend our time in prayer. So let's go to the Father. Dearest, loving, heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you so much for loving us as you do, for teaching us from your word, for letting us see Jesus. Father, help us live for him. Each person we talk to, each person we're with, help us be a blessing in their lives. Help us be better listeners. Help us be better helpers. Help us to show the kindness of Christ and call people to want to follow you and to love you with all their hearts as they see us doing that very thing. In your son Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, uh, like I said, we're in John 3. We're going to start, we're going to back up and start in verse 6 again, uh, just so that we can see the context. It says, he said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. In other words, I was born physically a long time ago, and so I'm flesh because I was born of the flesh. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Okay, if I was born of the flesh and that made me fleshly, when I'm born of the spirit, that makes me spiritual. In fact, the apostle Paul goes so far that in Ephesians 2 verse 6, it says, you as a Christian, because you've been born in Christ, you have been raised up and seated together with him in the heavenly places in Christ. You're already living in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. How can that be? Because there's a spiritual aspect of life. Uh, in Col excuse me, first, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, uh, Paul said to the church in Corinth, he says, while we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are unseen, for the things which are seen are temporal, temporary. The things that are unseen are eternal. And so there is a spiritual, eternal reality. Okay, God is spirit, John 4, 24, and so he made us in his image, and when we were born of the Spirit, now we're spiritual. We really have been raised up, seated together with him in the heavenly realms, in Christ Jesus. That's what it says in Ephesians 2, 6. And that's what he says here, the Spirit, that's what he's born of the Spirit, is spirit. So you're spiritual. You, you don't have a soul. You are a soul, and right now you have a body. One of these days, you're not going to have a body until Jesus comes back and you get a new one. It's going to be really great. But, but the thought is, you are a soul and you're made in the image of God. And so now that you've been born in Christ, you've been born again, born, literally born from above. Now you're spiritual primarily. The spiritual is the most important. And that has to be most important in all of our decisions. And we'll get to that as we, as we continue here. Verse 7, he says, uh, do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Okay. He didn't say you should. He said, you must be born again. Okay. You have to, if you want to have any life, remember what he said in verse five, verily, verily, amen, amen. Pay attention, pay attention. 
Verily I say unto you, unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he shall in no way enter the kingdom of heaven. That's why he says here in verse 7, you must be born. He says, don't marvel. Don't marvel at that because it's that serious. There's no other way in. You've got to be born of water and the Spirit. You've got to be born again. He says, you must. He says, don't marvel. I said, you must be born again. Verse 8, he says, now, the wind blows wherever it goes. Okay, wherever it wishes. And you hear the sound of it. But you don't know where it comes from. And you don't know where it's going. So it is with everyone who's born of the Spirit. Okay, you can't see the wind, but you can see the leaves blowing in the wind. You can't see the wind, but you can hear what the wind's doing. Okay, you can see the power of the wind as it blows everything around. And so you have to see the Spirit the same way. When I was born in Christ, I can't see the Spirit. He's in there somewhere because God promised that he's in there, but you can't see it. But hopefully I live in such a way that people can see what the Spirit is doing in my life. And hopefully you're living in such a way that people can see what the Spirit's doing in your life. That's what it's supposed to be. That's what, that's what the Christian life is. Living for Christ. What's our lesson? Living for Jesus in the book of John. Okay. And so the Spirit does that. And the Spirit wants to, its main job, uh, and I really need to put this one down. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18, one of my favorite verses of Paul. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 3, 18, you're in a dark room. The only light coming into the room is coming from a mirror, but you can't see what's in it, okay, because there's a veil. And then the veil is lifted, and when the veil is lifted, you realize the image of the mirror is Jesus. And the more intently you look at the image of the mirror, a transformation takes place. But the image in the mirror stays the same. The transformation that's taking place is taking place in you. Now, what the verse says, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18, it says, But though we, with unveiled faces, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into his likeness from glory to glory, even as the Lord from the Lord who is the Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit's main job is to make you more like Jesus, to help me be more like Jesus. That's what his job is. And so if I'm going to live for Jesus, I'm not going to do it with my own brute strength and awkwardness. If I'm going to live for Jesus, I need the help of the Spirit. And the Spirit helps make me more like Jesus. So my job is I'm looking at Christ. 2 Corinthians 3.18, as I'm looking at Christ, the Spirit is transforming me and making me more like Jesus. Okay, so the Spirit does this. You can't see him, but you can see what he does. And you know people. You know men, you know women. They have spent so much time with Jesus, looking at Jesus in the, in the mirror of his word, and the Spirit is just transforming them, making them so much more like Jesus. <clears throat> and that's what you want happening in your life. And hopefully it is already happening in your life. Okay, so let's continue. Verse 9. He says, now, Nicodemus has heard all this stuff about being born again, born of water and the Spirit, and he's just, he doesn't understand. And so Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? See, he's, he's, he's a teacher of Israel. He doesn't understand. The Bible's not written for professors as much as it's just written for you and me. It's written for children. And we need to have the heart of a child if we want to understand it. And so in verse 9, he's, Nick says, how can these things be? And Jesus, I love his answer. Jesus answered him. He said, are you a teacher of Israel? And yet you don't understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak uh, of what we know and we bear witness to what we've seen, but you do not receive our testimony. He said, if I told you earthly things and you don't believe them, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Okay, Jesus is saying, this being born of water and of spirit, it's a pretty easy thing. It's pretty easy to understand. It's wet, it's messy, it's humbling, but God chose wet and messy and humbling. Okay, it's not a symbol, it's not a sign. It's when you enter into a covenant with God. You're saying, okay, I'm dying to my old life. I'm being buried with Christ by baptism and death and raised to walk in newness of life. In uh, Romans 6, verse 3 and 4. Uh, raised through faith in the operation of God, Colossians uh, 2, verse 12. And, and, and so this idea of 
He says, you can't understand physical things. What if I told you about heavenly things? He says, you're a teacher of Israel. You should understand. You should be able to see things spiritually. Jesus can help all of us see things spiritually. But we need to go to the source. If any man lacks wisdom, what? James 1. Let him ask of God. Verse 5. If I want wisdom, I go to the source. If I want spiritualism, I go to the source. Of all the prayers we have in the New Testament, what's the number one prayer request? It's not for people with cancer. It's, it's not for people who need a job. It's not for people whose pets are sick. The number one prayer request in the Bible is for spiritual insight and understanding. I want to see, I want to understand. Okay, that's what Jesus is talking to Nicodemus about here. He says, you're a teacher in Israel. Why aren't you understanding this? This is spiritual. But you're made in the image of God. You're supposed to understand spiritual things. Okay? And so he says, uh, he goes on, verse 13. He says, no one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, that is, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Okay, uh, first, he says, the only person who's ascended up in heaven, to, who can tell you about what heaven's like? Nobody can tell you what heaven's like, except Jesus. Why? Because he's the one who ascended to heaven, and he's the one who came down to earth. Okay, so Jesus can tell us all about heaven better than anybody else. And then he says, after he tells them that, he says, you remember back in the book of Numbers, Remember when they sinned and, and God put a plague of serpents among them? Instead of taking away all the snakes, God said, okay, I got a job for you. I'm going to have Aaron make this brass serpent and, you, and he's going to put it up on a pole and you look at that thing and you ask God to forgive you and he will. And sure enough, they did. He said, well, the same way that that serpent was lifted up on a pole and they trusted in, in God, and he say, used that serpent to save him, he says, I'm going to be lifted up. When he said lifted up, if you go back to chapter 12, uh, Jesus says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Okay, now we, think, we sing songs about that, but we don't sing songs about that in the right context. Because when he says, when I am lifted up from the earth, the very next verse says, he said this, telling them the manner with which he would die. See, being lifted up, they knew what that meant. That meant being put up on a cross. The Romans had been, not, that wasn't something in Israel, but that was something that happened in Rome. And Rome crucified people, thousands. And so Jesus saying, I'm going to be lifted up on a cross. The Son of Man is going to be lifted on the cross. Well, they thought the Son of Man was supposed to be the Messiah, and the Messiah was supposed to be this king, and he was going to beat up Romans and set up some physical... No, no, no. He's going to beat up Satan and set him free from sin, which was the way more important battle. All right? But he's saying, I'm going to be lifted up. When he says, I'm going to be lifted up, I can just see Nicodemus going, what in the world? Hey, ha, 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 if you're supposed to be this great teacher in Israel, and you're going to be the Son of Man, how can you be lifted up? You can't be lifted up. You're... You can't be crucified. But he was. The crucifixion was terrible. But it saved you. And it saved me. And it saved everybody who's ever been saved. Nobody gets to go to heaven because they're good enough except Jesus. We, the rest of us get to go to heaven because he's good enough. Because he went to the cross and paid the price for our sin. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. Okay, now... Uh, to him who knew no sin became sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Okay, him who knew no sin, that's Jesus, became sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's what his death on the cross accomplished. Now he says, whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Well, great, I just, all I have to do, I just have to say I believe. Saying you believe isn't believing. There's a whole thing about that. 
If faith doesn't do anything, uh, James, Jesus' little brother in James 2 says, if faith doesn't do anything, it's dead. Okay? Uh, if faith doesn't accomplish anything, it's dead. And so faith has to do something. There's things that are involved in faith. In other words, if you trust in God, if, if Noah trusts in God, and God says, I'm going to have this big flood, and I want you to build this ark, and, I want you, and I'm going to gather all these animals together two by two, and I'm going to... And, and Noah says, hey, I believe that you have the power. You can just pick us up off the earth and wipe off the earth and then set us back down. I don't even need to build an ark because I have that much faith in you. That's not faith. Faith obeys. And faith doesn't obey. It's not faith. Okay? So faith is supposed to obey. And, and so he says, whoever believes in him has eternal life. Uh, <clears throat> later on, the word faith or disbelief and disobedience are used interchangeably in later on in John 3. And we'll get to that. That's down in verse 36, I believe it is. Yeah, uh, verse 36, he says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. The wrath of God remains on him. And so faith has to submit to God. And so if you believe God, and he tells you to repent, you repent. If, he tell, if you believe God, he tells you to love him with all your heart, you love him with all your heart. Okay? If, he tell, if you believe God and he tells you to be baptized, then you need to go be baptized. Whatever it is he tells you to do, you do it because... And that stuff doesn't save you. Jesus saves you when you believe enough to submit your life to him. And if you don't submit your life to him, saying you believe isn't believing. If a skunk goes by and has this sign that says, I'm a rabbit, don't pet it. Okay? It's not a rabbit. It just says it's a rabbit. If you say you have faith, that doesn't mean you have faith. Your life has to show you have faith by your obedience, by your submission to God. Okay? So we'll go on. Verse 16. Now, Jesus is going, still talking to Nicodemus. And remember, when he talks to Nicodemus, all of the verbs Jesus uses are plural. So he's not just talking to Nicodemus. Nicodemus has brought somebody with him. And so this is for Nicodemus and whoever's with him. So he says, when he says you, he means what, down in Alabama, we say y'all, okay? And so he's saying y'all. So it's, it's a plural you every time he mentions it here. I just want you, for the context, that'll help us. Starting in verse 16. It says, here's a verse you might know. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We all love that one. We know that one. Okay? God, so, now I believe the key, the key word in John 3, verse 16 is the word so. A lot of people love, but God so loved that he gave his son. Do you love like that? Is there anybody you love so much that you would let your son, your only son, die for them in their place? and suffer horribly so they could be saved? Whew. That's a lot of love. I mean, I got two sons and a daughter, and I don't want to give a son. I mean, I love you and all that, but I don't want to give my son for you. Jesus said, God loves that much. God so loved that he gave his son that whoever believes in him should not perish, should have everlasting life. See, this life's temporary. We already mentioned that in 2 Corinthians 4.18. But the next life is eternal. And the life that that life started already down here. See, eternal life is not when you die. Eternal life already started when you were born in Christ. My eternal life already began. In fact, Jesus said, I'm not going to die. We, we get to John 8, 52. He says, you believe me and never see death. I'm not going to die. Now, my body's going to die unless Jesus comes back first. And your body's going to die if Jesus doesn't come back first. But if you're already in Christ, you're not going to ever die. Your body will, but that's not you. Okay? God so loved that he gave so he could live eternally. But he's not done. Look at verse 7. We, we have to stop at verse 16, but we need to read verse 17 also. It says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Jesus could have come in with armies, 200,000 angels, 200 million angels, excuse me, and just wrecked havoc on all the wicked and judged all these people. But he didn't do that. He doesn't want you to have to follow him. He wants you to want to follow him. So, 
he so loved that he didn't come to judge. He came to save. Okay, verse 18. For whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Okay? There's only one way out. There's only one way out. Okay? If you're halfway down the Grand Canyon on a donkey or a mule, okay, and there's only one way back up out of there, okay? Well, here he says there's only one way, and it's Jesus. And if you don't believe in him, you're already condemned. See, people aren't lost, you know, because they did a sin that was so terrible they couldn't be forgiven because the apostle Paul was killing Christians and God saved him. And he said in 1 Timothy 1, he says, it's a faithful saying worthy of all exceptions. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the chief. He says, I'm the worst sinner. He saved me. Have you killed any Christians this week? He saved him. Okay, so he says, you can be saved in Christ. But if you don't believe in Christ, you're already lost. You're not lost because Jesus did something. You're lost because you did something, because the wages of sin is death, and we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. So I'm not sin because I'm not lost because something Jesus did. If I'm lost, it's because of something I did. But fortunately, Jesus saved me. I'm good. And hopefully he saved you, and you're good too. Let's go on. Okay. He said, uh, verse 19, now, this is the judgment that light has come into the world. Now, that's a good part. But we're going to find out something here in these next three verses, 19, 20, and 21, to show us why some people aren't ever going to want to come to church. They're not going to ever want to read the Bible. They're not going to ever want to ever sing praises. It says, again in verse 19, And this is the judgment. Light has come into the world. And people loved darkness rather than light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and doesn't come into the light, lest his works be exposed. But whoever does what is true, he comes into the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. He says there's some people, they just don't want to come into the light. Why? If I come into the light I have to quit doing some of those sins that I want to do. Do you love Jesus more than that? If you love Jesus more than that, you're willing to let go of those sins. Are you willing to let go of those sins so that you don't have to be lost forever? You want to let go of those sins so you can have eternal life? You want to let go of those sins so you have brothers and sisters all over the world? You want to let go of those sins so you have a purpose to live, to, to tell other people how amazing Jesus is? I mean, there's so many blessings available in Christ. In fact, <clears throat> in Ephesians 1, 3, he says, all spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ Jesus. They're yours in Christ Jesus. Everything, all spiritual blessings, they're in Christ. And so are you willing to surrender your life for that? <clears throat> no, I kind of like doing these other sins. See, that's how it works out. <coughs> Excuse me. People didn't reject Jesus because they just couldn't believe that that could possibly be true. They rejected Jesus because they realized that if they surrendered their lives to Jesus, they wouldn't be allowed to keep doing all those things they like doing in darkness. And notice the darkness. Okay, if somebody's trying to break into my house and the lights come on, he runs away. How come? Lights doesn't hurt him. Ooh, yeah, he doesn't want anybody to see him. Why? Because he's doing something wrong. He's breaking into somebody's house. Okay, when people, okay, a couple out in the park, doing something they ought not to do, all right? Somebody flips on the lights, they run away. Why? Because what they're doing was evil. What they're doing is wrong, okay? They don't want their evil to be exposed. Now, on a personal level, you know what that, you know what that means? Some people aren't going to want to be around you because you read your Bible and you pray and you bless people and you try to help people have a great day and you try to help people walk close to God. And they say, I can't be around him. Why? Because he makes me feel terrible. See, misery loves company. They want you sinning like they're sinning. 
They want you to be in the darkness rather than they want to be in the light. Instead of them wanting to come into the light, they want you to come into the darkness. See, here you are, you're a Christian. You decide, I'm going to quit drinking because alcoholism was messing up my marriage and messing up my job, messing up my life. So I'm going I'm to quit that. People who would never offer you a drink will now offer you a drink when they find out you quit drinking. When you quit smoking. People that never would have let you have a cigarette will let you bum a cigarette because you quit smoking. Why? They want you to be as miserable as they are. They're in the darkness. They don't want to come into the light. They don't want hanging around with people who are in the light because it exposes that they're not in the light. And there's people that are like that. You don't get mad at them. You pray for them. And you try to love them in the kingdom. But th if they love the darkness, they don't want to come to the light. You pray for them, you hug them, you love them, you do what you can. But they don't want to come to the light. And that, it's not because it's not understandable. Charlie went to college, got a degree in theology so he could be a minister. But after his 10-year-old girl died, he got mad at God. He got so mad at God, he didn't believe God did anything. He didn't believe God created the world or anything. In fact, you may have read his book. It's called Origin of the Species. His last name was Darwin. Okay? Why? He, he got mad at God. So many people, they get mad at God. We need to not love darkness because love and darkness keeps you out of the light. Let's not go there. Amen? Amen. Okay, now, starting in verse 22, we're going to go back to John. Not John, the disciple of Jesus, John the baptizer, Jesus' cousin who's six months older than Jesus is. It says, after this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside. And he remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing in Enon near Salem because there was much water there. And the people were coming and being baptized for John had not yet been put in prison. John's going to wind up being put in prison and, and the gospel John's not going to tell us about, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell us that he caught the king, Herod, stealing his brother Philip's wife. And he says, it's not lawful for you to take your brother's wife. It's in the, you know, in the law of Moses, you can't do that. And so most people don't rebuke kings, but he did. He winds up in prison. But this is before he goes in prison. And John was the most, the most popular pre preacher that Israel ever had, the most popular prophet Israel ever had. And all of Judea and all of Jerusalem came out to hear him and to be baptized by him in the Jordan. Well, he was baptizing in Enon near Salem because there was enough water there. It says because there was much water there. If you're going to baptize a bunch of people, you need a bunch of water because you have to baptize them. Now, later on in John 13, Jesus is going to be at the supper, the last supper in the upper room. And he's going to say, one of you that I eat with is going to betray me. And Peter kind of punches John, who's right next to Jesus. He says, Psst, ask him, ask him. And so John says, Psst, which one, which one? And Jesus says, the one I dip with in the bowl. Now, the word there for dip is the word bapto, means to dip. Okay, but... Uh, the word baptize is from baptizo, which means to dip completely. Okay, dip is to dip, but baptizo is dip completely. He says, you're going to be dipped completely. Well, that's why John had to be baptizing in Enon near Salem, because there was much water there. There had to be enough water so he could do the baptizing. I, I told people, my grandpa, I was named after my grandpa, Jack Duncan. What a name, Jack Duncan. Should have been a preacher, Duncan. <laughs> Sorry. All right. But anyway, uh, back in verse 22 and 23, John was baptizing there uh, because he had enough water and he had not yet been put in prison. Uh, we're going to have to stop there because we're running out of time. Uh, and Lord willing, next week we will begin in verse 25 and continue with the ministry of John and what he's trying to teach his disciples about Jesus. All right. In the meantime, our job is to live for Jesus. May God richly bless you and Jesus give you peace in your believing.